morning, beautiful people. How's Yo. it going, my man? Good morning. You've got a Angelica. you've got a new name, Angelica. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Malta ending up in the wrong user account. <laughs> <laughs> Malta. Close. Oh, how did you change? Oh, that, that was thing? easy. That was amazing. Skills, you, man. Skills. That is skills. The IT blokes are flipping crazy. <laughs> but there is cool, man. So anyway, but you know that we've obviously been chatting a fair bit on on email and stuff. Uh, <laughs> And You're probably the most fun person to write emails to in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic. I think it's like you said, when, you, when I read your, uh, your one thing that you want to solve, which is around, human, which is around communication, yeah. I, Craig and I have talked, spoken about this so many times. We always said almost the number one thing in the world which either does a lot of good or a lot of bad is communication. And, yeah, for sure. And good emails. Like, yeah, and good emails. The importance yeah. of good emails. Like, there's almost nothing more important. You know what I mean? Like you can change a relationship through an email, like literally, you know what I mean? Or build a relationship nicely through a good email. And ah, it's so weird that people don't do it. They don't invest the time in just writing a few extra sentences. No idea. No idea. Yeah. And I'm curious about the name, Ridiculously Human. How did you come up with it? <laughs> well, we, we kind of, we, we did a, a method called uh, brain writing um, and then we crossed it with brainstorming. So basically we, we both came to the table with like a set of names already. Um, and then what we started doing is we started, uh, we're like, okay, let's try think of a few more now that we see what we have each come up with. And we just started writing down in a Google doc, like more and more and more. And, and then it was like real time, like while we're sitting there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I think, I don't know, like, someone i think craig wrote ridiculously and then there was human appearing in some of them and then we just literally went what about ridiculously human and we both thought about it for a second and we're like oh that sounds pretty cool <laughs> um, like and, uh, because the, the subtext has always been like we wanted to do we love human beings the the, the tales that we all have like these uh you know like your story is like epic you know what i mean that, that's a human story uh, you, and, and so we, we had this, this like bubbling underneath, we just couldn't find the right things. And then eventually when we got sat there like that, it was, we, as soon as we wrote that down, we were like, yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so cool when it comes together like that, you know. Sweet stuff. Well, good morning there, Eric Bergman. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Uh, it is a Sunday morning. You've woken up super early for us, so we really appreciate it, buddy. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to have a ridiculous amount of fun doing this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> but so are we, my man. Um, so just a little bit of background. I, uh, I actually met you, I don't know, probably six weeks ago now. On, uh, on a different sort of platform where uh, we met through Fei Wu, who's actually been a guest on our podcast previously. And she runs a, like a sort of bi-monthly uh, meeting with fellow podcasters. And uh, you were a guest on that. Um, and you just told us your story. And I was like, flipping out, oh, this guy is cool. And uh, uh, we've got to speak with him. So, <laughs> so that's how kind of we, we know you. And, uh, you know, thanks for the, the cool interactions that we've had since then via email. We were talking about it just before we started. Like, you have the best way of finishing off emails. And uh, it's really, really engaging. So thanks for making that so enjoyable. Thank you very much. I actually have a cheat sheet with ways of ending emails. I have a list with like 100 different ways just to be creative. And whenever I come up with something new, I put it in there. So I love it. It's a fun way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. When I first, when I read your first one, I was like, that's cool. I like that. <laughs> uh, classic stuff. Cool, man. So, so let's kind of like begin things off. Um, you have like this desire and spirit in you to create things right and and you also talk about one of the things in life that you are really good at and that is making money okay and and this kind of started from an early age for you you were four years old and you and your brother made your first two hundred dollars so how does a four-year-old manage to do something like that okay so I was a little bit old, but we can start with a story when I was four years old, actually. So a different story when one we're referring to. 
me just get back into a memory for a second. Okay, so I'm, I'm standing outside of this, this big door and <laughs> I really don't want to be there. Uh, but, but I made a promise to be there and I'm, <laughs> I'm terrified. And after a while I'm reaching out and I'm pressing the doorbell. And I hear the steps on the other side. <laughs> I feel this lump in my stomach and I just want to run away, but, but I don't. And then this old grumpy man opens the door and I look up at him and he looks at me and then I start singing jingle bells, jingle <laughs> bells. It's, it's me and my brother and we're dressed up like Santa's little helpers and he has forced slash inspired me to go out and sing to our neighbors begging for change. <laughs> and this old man, he goes from being this super grumpy face to just shining up in a bright smile. And, oh, cool. and it actually worked. We got some, some sense there. And, and then we kept working to, to all our neighbors around. And we did this for, for years. And personally, I don't actually remember this story, but it's, it's a story that my father has told me a lot of times. <laughs> and he sees this as the first time that, well, mainly my brother realized that we could actually do things to make money on our own. So he was seven and I was four. And that became like the first entrepreneurial thing. He started all these projects. He always just took me with him and I learned so much from him. And what I love about this story is that I think a lot of people are entrepreneurs and did entrepreneurial things as children, but never even considered it, that this is a super small entrepreneurial aspect of things that was the first thing that really got me going. Uh, we didn't make 200 bucks from that one. That's another story, but that's how it, <laughs> that was the first one that actually came to mind um, from a very early age. <laughs> that's cool. And what, what's your singing voice like? <laughs> jingle bells, jingle <laughs> bells, jingle all the way. <laughs> but were Beautiful. you singing it in English or in Swedish? Uh, it was in Swedish, but no one would understand if I did it in Swedish. <laughs> Come on, we've Swedish. had the English version now. Come on. <laughs> You got some funny. serious editing to do, yeah, Craig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's me and Eminem. You know, we all started as singing Christmas songs. There we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We all start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you know Sweden was really like quite an idyllic and happy sort of country. That's the sort of impression one get one gets. Uh, what, what is what was it like growing up in Sweden? Yeah, I would say that Sweden is is the perfect country to have a childhood in, at least compared to what I've seen. That it's a very safe environment. It's it's built for families in so many ways. So I grew up in in an area called Tokarp, which ironically I didn't realize back then, but I now realize means crazy village. In kind of <laughs> translated, and uh, and and they're built up like all these, uh, yeah, all these small houses around this, and there's always a playground in the middle, and there's a certain number of houses, maybe fifty houses in one circle, and then there is a next circle of fifty houses and a playground in the middle, so everyone can always see there, and my parents just opened the door and went out and and plays. So it was a very safe and and great place to to grow up in outside of a small city and yeah that's a very common way of growing up in sweden so i'd say it's it's wonderful it's rainy but safe <laughs> yeah 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 i, I always kind of like wonder like the, the the swedish mindset in terms of like family and and looking after people and that just seems so different from a lot of the world you know like you put these great policies in place and um, you know, it's very progressive, you know, like now I think you have the, the four day uh, work week and these sort of things. Why is that, you know, and is this something that's sort of nurtured from a young age? 
I think that it it all boils down to to the weather. And in Sweden, if we go back a thousand years, if you didn't uh, well work hard, really hard during the summer, and then was comfortable being in a small space together with a lot of other people in the winter, you literally wouldn't survive because of the cold and, and everything else. If you were in South Africa, I guess if you had a fishing rod, you would probably survive all year round regardless. <laughs> but, but in Sweden, it was, it was tough. So I believe that this is something that has shaped our culture for millennia. That we, we had to be super structured. We had to work really hard and we had to cram in in small places together to, to survive. And that then created all of these... Uh, these bonds and things around it and it's deeply ingrained in our in our culture today even if it's obviously different but that comes i think everything comes from the weather one way or another hmm. super yeah. interesting but there's a lot of like strength culture there as well like uh you know these the thoughts of like lifting stones and from your <laughs> forefathers and stuff and i just it always seems so interesting and, and hard work like you mentioned it's just like seems like ingrained but but also like you mentioned like progressiveness and uh like uh just having thinking about politics and helping others and things like that it just seems to be thought about in your country a lot yeah it's i mean it even to ridiculous means i would say <laughs> one thing that yeah. sort of that comes to mind is so this sign where it's with a zebra crossing you know there is a man walking over a zebra crossing in in sweden he is called yeah Herr Gorman, which would translate to mr walker we can say so that <laughs> sign is called mr walker so everyone is uh, in in kindergarten gets taught to okay look out for mr walker and, and do that <laughs> and that's always been a man and a couple of years ago that became a really big debate in Swedish media that why isn't there a Mrs. Walker? Mm -hmm. They actually ended up spending a lot of tax money changing, I don't know, half of the signs or a lot of the signs to a Mrs. Walker. Wow. Because, well, that should be equal. And what even took that to the top was when they had done that, they felt that media felt that but they are too uh, too sexist the mrs walker she looks too hot she's got a dress and boobs and stuff <laughs> so then they redid it <laughs> at least in, no ways. in because they shouldn't be too sexist signs them so wow. in a way we could say that it's very progressive and very <laughs> yeah. very good but it's it's also a bit over the top sometimes <laughs> i believe that goes down to to not having any real problems in many ways yeah i remember i was actually in south africa a couple of years ago and i spoke to i was in johannesburg and spoke to a friend there about uh, ethnicity and he said that yeah you know exactly how many black people white people or whatever it is that's actually public knowledge in a sense the way i understood it and i said that we would never have that in sweden that would never be legal to kind of keep track of and then we started realizing the differences in problems that the countries have. Like, yeah, mm. no one in South Africa would care about the Mrs. Walker sign because mm. there is criminality and there is poverty and there is all of these things that Sweden have the luxury of not worrying about. Yeah. Mm. So mm. Fascinating. Come from that. It's funny you say that actually just a funny story that came to mind is if, when we were really young, one of my friends moved over from uh, Belgium and the teacher once at the beginning of the year said, okay, how many black people are there? Please put up your hands. How many white people and how many colored people? That's what we call people in South Africa. And so anyway, my one, my last friend, he, he didn't put up his hands. <laughs> We're like, why did, what, what are you, buddy? You're like, you should be white, you know, according to this thing. And he, he never put up, he said, I'm not white, I'm European. <laughs> <laughs> and we still tease him about it today, but he was like, he also didn't get it. Like why you can ask like where, what kind of ethnicity you are. <laughs> no, no, I, I was so confused, especially about the word colored. I'd forgotten that that was, what, what does that even mean? 
yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's like it's like you know a kind of mix between two people, but it's also like it's more than that because um, it goes back like more culturally as well. So there's mm. there's, there's even a, a, a greater mix of people there. So Craig, maybe you can explain a little bit better. I don't oh, know. I, I think you did right. I think one thing is that in in America, colored is a very derogatory term. Uh, yeah. as far as I understand, but, but in South Africa, it's like a, a, one of the races that live there. So you might have Indian, uh, white, black, whatever. And then colored is like a, one of these, like Gareth said, a sort of, a a, a, a culture, a subculture within the South African culture. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's the same. And how yeah. extremely different that is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It is very interesting actually. And, and it's weird, it's, but it's weird kind of like, when you grow up with these things, you also, you don't necessarily think of them, you know, um, mm-hmm. you're just part of it. So looking back now, you're like, okay, yeah, maybe that is kind of weird or, or, or not. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, in a way that becomes all the cultural things around us is like the water to a fish. It's just there. You're not thinking about it. It's just part of everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. It's exactly. insane that you can live under the water all the time, but for a fish that's like yeah of course blue blue that's what i do (laughs) exactly (laughs) so but talking about like i guess say community and and you know these sort of things you still felt very lonely between the years of seven to twelve as a youngster so can you tell us a bit more about why that you felt that way yes so when i when i started school uh, in kindergarten, things were fine, but when I started school, somehow I, I got started off the wrong, off the wrong foot already from the beginning, and I never really managed to find my spot in there or find friends really at all. So, I I was very lonely for you know, the first to the sixth year of school. That's seven to twelve years old, and. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that I was bullied. People weren't always very nice to me, but I, it wasn't as bad as it can be described. And I've heard a lot worse stories from other people, but it was more a general feeling of loneliness. Like during the summer breaks, I had my brother, uh, but he was older than me as well. And But there wasn't much other things going on or other people to hang out with. So it was, I had fun in the football team kind of sometimes, but it's, it was a general feeling of loneliness for for all of that part of my life. And then I turned 13 and my family moved. Uh, So I started in in a different school. And I don't know what's happened or how that happened, but suddenly I became friends with, with everyone. And I happened to get friends with the richest kids in my school. So I moved, we moved outside of the city but that became part of the school district where all the richest kids of my hometown lived. So I was living in this small little house outside of the city where they had these big fancy villas. And, but I somehow got a part of that group of people. So my closest friends were the IT millionaires, twin sons and the car dealerships son and the real estate guy's son. And these mm-hmm. became my, my peer group. And I was so desperate to fit in because I hadn't fit in before. And then money became this big, big object that I felt like, okay, they have all of this. I really do not. I'm not as good enough, as good as they are. And I tried desperately to to fit in. So I spent all of my money that I made from all of my small little entrepreneurial ventures but also all the money I could other, ever get from my parents on, on things that could be seen. And I wanted to have labels on my clothes. I wanted to have mm-hmm. these and these things and did everything I could to do that. And still there were, so like boys do, there was a lot of mocking and joking around and like, oh, Eric, how can you live in that shitty little house? And mm-hmm. how can you drive that old crappy car? These kind of things. And mm-hmm those comments became like food for this attention craving and revenge craving little monster growing inside me. Like I I just desperately wanted to fit in. So somewhere here, 
money started to become extremely important to me and tied so much to my, my self-worth or just wanting to have friends and don't wanting to lose them. So all of this, yeah, that's my part of life from seven to, I don't know, 16, something like that, where this were the big parts of that. And that then led onwards. Hmm. Mm. Did, did you ever have like your mates, did they ever come and stay at your house and stuff? Or did you feel awkward about that as well? Then not having this like mansion? So it happened, but I was probably staying at their places 10 times more than they ever mm. got to my place. And it was this barrier of, of a distance as well. Like to get to my place was far. You had to go by car or something like that. And everyone else were living closely together and close to school and everything like that. And mm. a lot of my friends had, yeah, they had a, a basement or an extra place in the garage where all the kids could hang out. So we had a lot of space. Well, we didn't at home. So sure, I could have something over, but we would cram in in my little room rather than yeah. having a floor for ourselves. So it's, we always ended up being anywhere else. And I remember feeling that I kind of, yeah, what's a good word for it? That I piggybacked on them too much all the time. I, mm. I couldn't reciprocate whatever they did for me. So I had dinner at their friends, at my friend's house all the time and I never got the opportunity to return the favor. And it wasn't my fault, but I couldn't really do anything about it. And they bought this nagging feeling in me constantly of, yeah, but Eric, you're not good enough for mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand that. It's super tough, eh? And um, when you were 18, things kind of changed like temporarily for a couple of years. You started playing online poker and then started earning a bit of cash, decent cash. Yes. So at 16, I started playing poker in school. And one thing we've always done with my family is to play a lot of card games. So that's something we've done on all vacations, all trips, all the time. And actually through card games, I fell in love with math quite early on. So I was really good at math and good at card games. And we started playing poker in, in school. And I, I won a lot in terms of what kind of money could be with just the friends in school. Mm. And then I turned 17 and I started playing online with a fake idea. Uh, and I started winning quite a lot. And at 18, as you mentioned, I won 1000 2000 4000 $8,000 a month when, mm. yeah, no one else had that kind of money, obviously. And this yeah, attention craving need for revenge in me just wanted everyone to see this. Right? Mm. So once again, I spent the money on things that could be seen, but this time I actually won in a sense i could compete with them and i could beat them and i mean looking back i can really see all the insecurity within me that made me do these things but at the time i was just so proud and just so i bought a car i bought a flashy tv i was the first one of my friends to get an apartment i bought all of clothes and ridiculous amount of champagne <laughs> it just wanting to show everyone that hey i'm actually good enough now mm. and this lasted for a year something like that and then i i stopped winning so i didn't start losing but i had creating this persona around me that money was my identity and when money is your identity life is freaking expensive and mm. so pretty much the same time as i graduated schools so i'm 19 I couldn't afford my apartment anymore. I couldn't afford the stuff I had and I had to move back into my parents' house and kind of, yeah, drop all the pride I had left and, and get back in there. Hmm. So that, yeah, that was, it was tough. But how it did also, it make you feel, like, how did it make you feel though? Like, you know, it's tough as, it must have made it been more than tough, I guess. Go eh? back into that emotion. I 
think the main feeling was sadness. Like I had this grinding sadness. I had built up this identity and this image of, okay, this is how life is going to play out from now on. I'm going to become this professional poker player. That's going to be my, my road to, to success and, and respect and, and the personality or everything that I dreamed of. And then I realized that, okay, that's not going to happen. And yeah, I can imagine that's how it would feel like if I really, really forced myself or focused to, to study a lot, to get into a certain school and, and then just being denied. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. felt that I, this was my dream. This is what I was going to do, but I didn't manage to qualify and actually be good enough doing it. And then I had to give up the identity that I that I built up, which felt like, yeah, part of me died with that. Like something that I had built up, something I worked hard for was just gone. And something that I took pride in was, was now something I had to be ashamed of. Like, before, if someone asked how things were going, I could tell them all these success stories and this and this is so good. And by telling all those stories earlier, obviously a lot of people kept asking, it's like, yeah, but Eric, why don't you anymore? And yeah. then having to give the other side of the story, which is similar then to, yeah, I can, it, it felt similar to being in a breakup and you're actually the one who, who gets left. And then people mm-hmm. ask, okay, but who left who? And like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a horrible answer, to, a horrible answer to give. And it ties into pride and dignity and, and sadness mm-hmm. and all these things. And I think that's how I felt going through this. And Eric, I mean, it's something that sort of I've had to deal with a bit in my life as well over the years. And, and why do you think people tie their self-worth to money? specifically out of all the things that potentially could be there to tie yourself with too. I think it goes, I mean, our culture is obviously so much about money. Money is the, I like to look at money as, as a religion and the only religion that ever managed to capture more or less the entire planet and that everyone is actually actively pursuing on a daily basis. There is, there is nothing compared to that. And where I would say that advertising and, and advertisement is, is God, where give or take an hour every day it, for all of our lives, we are in connection with advertising mm. one way or another. And advertising, regardless of the product, I would say have exactly the same uh, the same purpose or the same meaning underlying meaning behind it and it's it's by this and you will feel better hmm. if you take this to to a car buy this be cool feel better or an insurance buy this be safe feel better or coca-cola buy this smile really big feel better <laughs> So this is a message that from a propaganda perspective is being pushed down our throat since we are babies and we grow up with this and everyone believes it. And it's really hard not to believe it because if anyone told us anything for an hour a day, our entire life, we would believe it regardless if it's earth is flat or there's people on Mars or whatever it might be, people will believe it. Mm. And that makes us, everyone wants to feel better. Everyone wants to be happy. So we believe in this truth. And I believed in this truth. And then that becomes the ultimate goal that becomes so easy for everyone to identify with or the goal to get there. Cause that's, it's, it's everywhere. And I just as everyone else put, put into that. And I think that's especially true for teenage boys where mm there are probably there are very few places in our society that are more permeated with peer pressure and identity than 
teenage boy groups, I would say, mm. and just desperately wanting to fit in. And especially since I didn't fit in as a kid, then as a teenager, I suddenly fit in and I desperately wanted to hold on to, to that. And then I, so that became it. And I think this goes for, for me and, and a lot of other uh, people in our society. I don't know. What do you guys think? Can you relate to this? Yeah, hundred percent. hundred percent. I think it's one of the best uh, descriptions and analogies of like kind of money and also you know, the description of like advertising stuff that I've, I've actually heard. Um, it's really like you laid it out clearly. It's like, okay, you've really, really thought about this. Um, and yeah. yeah, it's super true, bud. And I recently am busy reading a book actually called Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. And he actually talks about money in there. And it's basically exactly what you said. Like, it's just a fake thing. There's so many fake things that we, well, not fake. It's, it's a, an idea. And then it becomes real because the people around you buy into the narrative. So your friends and family, and this, this, this idea grows around you. And then you, you can have other ideas like religion and all these other things. Even government is just an idea started by someone who's at the top of this, but then other people buy into that idea and then it just becomes real and then it becomes a real thing, but it's just a weird sort of a thing that has been generated in our own minds. And it's a really fascinating read actually. And yeah, you basically just, uh, yeah, had a good synopsis of his book there. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, really fascinating, but you've always been an entrepreneur Eric, at heart and, um, sort of by 2011, you had tried a few different businesses and as you'd mentioned, and, um, you decided to move to Malta, uh, with your best friend at the time, uh, Emil, uh, to find jobs and, and carry on with your side businesses. How, how was that journey? Yeah, so I graduated school in 2009. I'll just wrap up the two years in between to give them more, some more context. So after graduation, I needed to do something. And I tried to get a job when I couldn't play poker. And I applied for this job in this cool clothing store, and I could really picture myself doing that. I mean, folding clothes, talking to the girls. I mean, imagine mm -hmm. the girls you get when you work in a clothes store. <laughs> <laughs> I pretty quickly started building up that dream instead. And I had this interview that went really, really well. I had to come back to the next interview and I felt that re went really well, but once again, I, I did not get that job. So I ended up feeling super rejected by that. I tried to be a party planner for a while and I completely failed miserably with that as well mm -hmm. and pretty soon I realized that I couldn't get a job because I failed at that couldn't play poker I failed at that I couldn't plan parties because I failed at that and all of them just hit my pride and my self-worth in many ways and instead I decided to to talk to my friend Emil and say hey we should start a company together and he said, sure, what, what kind of idea do you have? None. Said, Great, let's go. <laughs> so we, we started doing, starting our first company, I think this is 2008, 2009. And well, we had a lot of business ideas. The first one was that we wanted to print on the, on the underwear, you know, these, all these t-shirts you could write things on here. We wanted to do that with the, with underwear because now everyone was wearing, so you could actually always see the elastics. <laughs> and you could write, I'm the king or, or single or I don't know, 12 inches, <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want to put there. And, and yeah, so this was our first big business idea. And yeah, how, how many pair of underwear do you think we sold? Uh, yeah <laughs> i don't know a few hundred maybe zero, zero. wow <laughs> no ways it was another complete failure so we, we had a bunch of failures like that and then we started doing uh, we started a web agency building websites for other companies and we managed to get some clients so we understood we can do this but we didn't manage to get it to fly we made a little bit money and we started building websites for ourselves where we, because we didn't have enough clients, we had to do something with our time. So we built websites comparing various online products and making commission on it. And the first were actually about bingo, online bingo. And 
this we did really hard for a couple of months and made once again another zero in the protocol gave up did a few other ideas we came back to this a year later so we're now late 2009 we're and we've actually made a thousand euros doing this and mm. that's like hey wow we didn't know that we checked these accounts and we found money and that really that became that spark that gave us all the motivation and inspiration to do this because we had zeros everywhere else and now suddenly we had a thousand bucks so we decided to to do this full time and it took us i don't know nine months or something to get to a point where we actually felt okay now we're making a thousand euros a month we can actually do this and then we moved to malta to set up a business and that became like the inception of of the way there that's cool, man. One of the things that that really stuck with me about the, the story of that is uh, that you really lived like very minimalistically <laughs> because I guess you're starting a business, you kind of have to do that, you know, like not turning on the heating for your showers and stuff, which, you know, is actually quite an important thing. I think anyway, like if you, if you are starting a business, you really do need to watch your expenses. It's a good thing to, to have. It's a good habit. Yes. Yeah. As you mentioned, so we, we lived in an apartment with me, uh, my girlfriend, Johanna and, and Emil, uh, we lived together when we moved down here and yeah, we had no money. So uh, yeah, as you said, we, we didn't turn on the water heaters. We didn't have hot water unless we absolutely had to shower. We had to <laughs> remember to turn it on like 30 minutes before so we could take a quick <laughs> shower just to save on electricity. Uh, we didn't have any heating in the winter, so it was freakishly cold. And yeah, I remember we had a thermometer. <laughs> One evening in the in the winter it was two degrees in the bedroom and we were going to bed it's like okay we need to turn on the heat to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. yeah, good times. But yeah, as you mentioned, we didn't have any expenses really in the business. We had a few domain names, a little bit of hosting, and we had only our time. And at the same time, we didn't want to take any money out of the company that we didn't absolutely have to, because we wanted it, it to grow. And we actually, I applied for a job when we came here. And once again, I get, got turned down. And Emil actually never even applied for a job. I think he was too lazy and too passionate about just <laughs> doing And But it, it, we actually managed to turn things around in, I don't know, probably the first year somewhere, we actually started making some decent money so we could turn on the heater and buy something else than noodles. Nice. <laughs> yeah the two minute noodles bad they come in oh, handy that's for sure. there. <laughs> <laughs> so so had you at this time actually named the business uh, because it did eventually turn something awesome so can you did, had you named it and also can you just tell us maybe a little bit more detail about what what it did actually do okay so let's start with the name because we've had a lot of names <laughs> and in our in our very first office uh we had well for starters we had a no pants rule so whenever you came into the office we hang our pants up on the wall <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean like no what like long pants, no pants. or whatever exactly, but, no pants. we sat in our underwear that was like proper development <laughs> you had all these spare under, under pants lying around that you had made from before yeah exactly <laughs> uh, so, and we had one of the first things we bought which might not have been super necessary was a ball pit, you know this that they have at McDonald's with a lot of red <laughs> or yellow <laughs> So we, we had that and we built we built a wall around it with the plywood and the zebra skin. So our office <laughs> was more or less two computers and ball, and in this ball pit we had a one meter high plastic pink flamingo that we named Morgan. So he was named Morgan. And so our first company we named Morgan after him. We had to have another company owning this company for some various reasons. So we named that Pink Flamingo. And then we had a third company that actually also owned this weird structure you have to do here in Malta. That was called Ball Pit. So that was... <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> and then we had to change. When we took on investors, one of the first things that they told us was, guys, you need to change the name. <laughs> 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 uh, that's funny man <laughs> yeah so that's that's how it started 
and that, then it changed name to Visa V, which means versus in old Swedish. And then it changed name to Katina, which is the name it's had since, which means link in, in Latin. So link as in chain. Hmm. And basically everything we do is, is online marketing. So we build digital comparison sites, uh, mainly through the uh, iGaming industry, like casino, poker, sports betting comparing all of these different products with each other. And we have one website that's called askgamblers.com that work with kind of a customer support for any casino. So if you have a trouble somewhere, or you feel that you've been unfairly treated or anything, we take that up with the casino and we do that publicly. So you can see like, okay, this uh, Gareth didn't get his bonus from Bet365 and he has sent us this evidence and we bring that up with Bet365 and say, hey, we, what, what's your take on this? And they might tell us, yeah, but it didn't apply to these terms and conditions. Or they say, yeah, this and this and that. And then we have been doing so many of this customer support stuff that we give a recommendation. Like, yeah, you should, the casino should pay the money. Or, yeah, Gareth, sorry, you're not going to win this. And we do this publicly. And most of the time, the casino go with our recommendation if we do it. So just last year, I think that we settled these kind of dis disputes for 8 million euros, give or take, wow. uh, on that website. So we, we compare these products and we get commission from it and we help players solve these disputes. And, and we do all of these different things in the ecosystem around the iGaming industry. Wow, wow. that's interesting. And the dispute uh, resolution, is that with like lawyers or was that just like... There is nothing legal about it uh, in the sense that we are never forcing anyone to do this, mm. but we are an authority and most of the time we rule for the casino because the casino is more playing by the rules more often than the players. Mm. It's very yeah. common that the players have tried to abuse some offer, doing for something, sure. cheating in one way or another, but quite a lot of times, I mean, 8 million euros worth of times in one year, uh, the casino actually have done something wrong wow. and they have then followed our recommendation Why we have said, yeah, but they did this and this and this. You actually, so a common thing could be that the casino haven't put something in their terms and conditions that they thought they had and they're mm. actually doesn't apply to their own terms and conditions. It's like, yeah, but you've said this and this. So this offer stands and our, we recommend, so we don't force anyone. But since it's important for the casino to have good reviews with us and followed our recommendations, a lot of them uh, go with our recommendations. That's interesting. super interesting, man. And also it's super cool, actually. Like you've almost become a regulator in some sort of way, mm. um, which is powerful. You know, you just built yourself up for, to do that. And, and just a quick question. When you say like casino, is this literally... Uh, like physical casinos or are they online casinos? Yeah, everything is online. Everything is online. Okay, interesting. Okay, cool, man. Mm. And so, Eric, you would, you know, been had some ups and downs and things like that. But in 2013 was was quite a tough year. Um, you started acquiring companies uh, to the amount of 20 or 25 in total, which is crazy. And uh, you were still only 24 years old. Tell us more about that. Yes. Yeah, so. We, we had some really good progress between 2011 when we came to Malta and 2013. But it, it was still just me and Emil and we built all kinds of these comparison sites, everything that we enjoyed doing. We just tried things. We, we threw things at the wall and we saw what stuck. Mm -hmm. And we got really good at understanding Google and these algorithms and how to rank high up in them and stuff like that. But in 2000 and yeah, 13, we started feeling, 2012, that, that, okay, what's next? How do we become real? We're still just two people playing around and we don't know anything. And we got in contact with these uh, investment company with people from the industry that I really look up to that done really cool things in the past. And we ended up selling half the business to them with the goal of learning as much as possible, building something much, much bigger, because we had no idea how to do this. And I was, I was 23 when we sold, 24, yeah, give or take. 
and then 2013 became the year when we really started scaling up. So we went from having no employees, more or less, to 10 employees within three months, and I hired all of them. We went from having more or less one project uh, to having five different companies trying to do these things and mm -hmm. going from never losing money in a month because we didn't have any cost to quickly draining our bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I did not think any of this through. So in 2013 became the most hectic year of my life, I would say. And I, barely slept and just tried to solve these things. And I had done all of these calculations, like yeah, if we do this and this and that, we would get money by this time. But I was completely off. So by that time, we didn't make any money at all. We just kept losing money. And we got to a point where we had to question, can we even pay, pay salaries? Mm -hmm. At the, the summer of 2013, and I felt like, shit, we will not make this. And by some miracle, things turned around. We made, we went from having revenues of 40,000 euros a month to 100,000 euros a month in one month. And I couldn't explain what happened. Hmm. I, I couldn't find the answer to it. Something happened. So it was a, a gift from above and <laughs> got us some, some space to breathe. But what happened after that was, so we were sitting, this is in Gibraltar, which is this teeny, teeny, tiny country south of Spain with 30,000 people. And my fiance was living in Spain, so we went back and forth. But that's another story. And we had an office there, which was above budget, but it was so hard to find a, an office that we could be in. And that office had been an old restaurant. And one day they come, came a guy from the government and knocked on the door and we're like, yeah, hi, what, what can we do for you? And he said like, yeah, sorry, you can't use this as an office. This has to be a restaurant. And we're like, yeah, but all our agreement says that this is an office. He's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. So we ended up having to move out from our office. And when wow. we finally felt like we had some, some place to, at least some, some financial safety and we moved to another office things turned out pretty well then another man came knock on our new office and and i opened the door and he said like are you eric bergman and i'm like yes and and he handed me a letter I took the letter and then he said you've been served mm. and i didn't know what that meant so i'm like thank you you <laughs> <laughs> and then i opened this letter and it turned out to be from the lawyers of our previous landlord the office that we had to move out of and they were suing us for all the rent from contracts in the future so we had what? been in the office for uh, i don't know three four months and now we had to pay for i don't know how many years the total fee was about 500 uh, thousand euros wow. money that we God. did not have whatsoever and once again my life just fell apart with this that i had no idea how to deal with this and yeah, going back to that feeling it's like i just got really really scared mm. once again I felt like okay everything's falling apart my identity as an entrepreneur now then is it's being totally challenged and I have no idea how to deal with these legal things. And it was so unfair. Like, yeah, of course we had to move. You tricked us into this, this office. Hmm. And luckily the business went pretty well during this time. It took us, I don't know, six months with this dispute and things. And we actually, we ended up settling outside of court because we, we thought that we would win, but the guy who sued us, was one of the richest and most powerful people in the country, which we didn't know. And in a country of 30,000 people, you don't want to take that battle, or at least we didn't mm -hmm. want to. So that's, yeah, that almost killed wow. me that year. Jeez. That, that, that's, that's really frustrating, isn't it? That must, I mean, that would make me flip and angry. Like they, they, they fooled you into doing that and then took advantage of you because of their power and authority like yeah. oh man flexing their, their wealth and their muscle and just yeah ridiculous yeah, that's where you hope karma works like super <laughs> well in the world that's for sure um for sure. yeah but 
and I just remember the the feeling of desperation and, and loneliness in that. And I don't know if you've ever been in some kind of legal challenges, but that's nothing has made me feel that small, that dealing with lawyers, things I know nothing about. Mm. I'm 24 years old and I'm being sued for mm. way more than I'm worth. And yeah, it was a few things. And, and at this time, when I speak about this with my, my fiance, Johanna, she was with me at the time as well, and, and with my parents today, I realized that I didn't even manage to tell them how I was feeling. They get so surprised when I bring this up, like I was in so much pain. Hmm. And I didn't think about it back then, but I didn't talk about this. I just kept everything on the inside, hmm. trying. I don't think I really tried to make it look better i'm not sure but i at least i didn't ask anyone for help or how to deal with this from them so they get really surprised today from how i'm feeling and i can see the importance of how much easier it would have been to deal with if i just talked about it instead of mm. holding up some kind of facade or something yeah yeah for sure um yeah it's interesting it's, it's so when you do get say like served like that um even though you haven't necessarily done anything wrong, wow, it really, really does. Like, it hits a different spot in your body. Like, it's just, it's, it's very difficult to explain to people. Like, you, you're like, what, wait, what do you mean? Like, I, I, I'm just a good bloke. I promise you, I didn't do this intentionally, but now you're making me feel really bad. And it can be super debilitating, you know? Um, so just, just before we move on though, but I just wanted to find out a little bit about how did you learn everything that you were doing? Because yeah, just how did you learn? And uh, you know, I mean, you built up a lot of sort of knowledge and, and a big business at that, at that point. So I think that if we go way, way back to that four year old kid, after opening that door, after starting thing, I just really enjoyed it. So I was terrified when I started, but I did it anyway. And ever since I've looked for different opportunities where I enjoy myself and I have the bless of being interested in enjoying things that has to do with money. It's, it's something that I enjoy. I enjoy meeting people, doing business, all of, of, all of these, these things. I, I can see another story there, like going back, So this is this was the deal of my life, like the biggest thing that I've, I've been going through, and I'm. We've been going in these negotiations for for days, and sitting by this table, and then I've given a new offer. He's been considering it, thinking about it, and and after a while, he like he finally puts the goods on the table. I put the payment on the table, and we we switch it over. And, and I'm holding this and it's a picture of Wayne Gretzky. And mm -hmm. this time I'm probably nine years old and I loved hockey pictures. I love these negotiations. I love these things. Trading, trading hockey picture was my biggest passion at the time. And I remember that feeling of holding the first picture of Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> and I can see this being probably the most important thing I learned through school was trading things and dealing things and negotiating. And mm. I guess that goes on on every schoolyard, but I took that as my biggest passion. And today I'm, I've been buying companies. I've been dealing with these kind of things, but the mentality is exactly the same mm. and learned it through, yeah, through the schoolyard, through doing these kind of things for just following my passion. I had no idea that I was making business at the time. I had no idea that singing to neighbors was going to be a part of an entrepreneurial journey, hmm. but I can really see it looking back how I've been blessed with just following what I enjoy doing and what I do enjoy doing happens to be something that I can make a lot of money doing. Hmm. So if, if my passion would have been art, it would be a lot harder to, to make money from it. It's not impossible, but a lot harder but my passion has been negotiations and business and, and learning things. And as you touched upon in the introduction, just building things. I was always the kid 
going back to childhood again, I was the kid building things all the time. Had so much Legos. I built these big tree houses with my father. I loved to mm. stop the stream of waters going next to our house and just trying to keep as much water back. Building things was my, my main passion, and, and it still is. But once again, now it's building relationships. It's building a podcast. It's building other things. And I'm just blessed with, with that being something I can make money from. Mm, I love Very that. Cool. It's so important to sometimes, I'm just hearing you like reminisce. And at the same time, it's, it's all in us. And we, we should definitely just think back to our youth and think of the things that really got us going and stimulated us and, and reignite something within us. You know, like when you were saying that, I was just remembering myself playing marbles and, and like trading marbles. And I hadn't thought about that, like until you mentioned that. And, you know, all these things in our life, they're all there and to, to get us where we are now. And maybe we can tap into some of that uh, later on. It's really cool. Yeah. I think, you know, Simon Sinek, the start yeah. with why. Yeah. Uh, amazing guy. Yeah. Start with why. Really cool book. He says this, that if you want to find out who you are, ask yourself what you did as a kid. Like, what, what did you do? Because then you didn't think that much about what other people did. You weren't mm. conditioned into doing something. And then see, what did you do then? And then ask yourself, what do you do now that is similar to that? So this kind of way of thinking comes from that book and oh, like has meant a lot to me where I can see okay, I'm connecting, connecting the dots here. That this is something I should do, do more of and mm -hmm. getting that playfulness into things then. Like how would, how would five-year-old Eric do it today? Yeah, he would mm -hmm. build things. That's what he's passionate about. And he would trade things, do these things and discuss and trying to figure things out. And I think that's a, a road to happiness then within me. Yeah, that's super cool, man. I love that. And, uh, and we've actually started noticing uh, ourselves similar things because we did, we recently, we interviewed each other on the podcast and we, we wrote, you know, like we did a storyboard for you. Ours was like 11 to 12 pages long each. Cause we were, <laughs> and it was really powerful, like going back and, and remembering things. And it actually makes you want to remember more, go that little bit deeper to remind yourself who you are or who you were and what you enjoyed. And, and then, like you said, create that link um now and um it's also cool that you mentioned simon because we're actually speaking with his team to hopefully have him on the podcast in, in the next oh, few wow, months i would love that which which would be that amazing so, cool. so they've been really cool we've been chatting to them for like almost two years now so yeah <laughs> it'll eventually come come to fruition which is great um so bud uh by 2015 uh, emil was actually super burnt out I know that you really struggled when you spoke about the company in public, like it almost bring you to tears. Uh, did it feel like at the time all the hard work was actually worth it? I have no idea what it felt like, to be honest. Yeah, so let's go back here. We're, we're closing in 2013. We decided to leave Gibraltar and come back to Malta because of this legal challenges. I had so bad associations to that place. And it came back here and 2014 became a year where everything just worked. We grow insanely quickly. We just kept raising the bar for whatever we wanted to do. We started making lots of money. We started buying all these, these companies that Craig referred to before. And I just ran. So before I had something, 2013, I kind of ran for my life. If we wouldn't make money then, we would fall and everything would crash. And then I just kept on going in that pace without really thinking about what I was going for. And we had this investment company that set with really go high targets like VCs does. And my job was to find ways to, to jump and get over there. And I can see now that I was chasing money i came back to that teenage boy that wanted to get to that point and i pushed myself very hard i had a whiskey bottle by the bed just to make me fall asleep every evening because i was so up tuned so every evening i i drank whiskey to fall asleep and 
I pushed Emil, then my business partner, in, in the same kind of way. And he was in charge of the development. So he's a tech genius. He built a calculator when he was eight years old. That's, hmm. wow. that's him. So he did those things. And I understood nothing of it. So when things didn't work, when something crashed, obviously I was on him for it. And, and then one day in 2000, uh, late 2014, I think it was, he just didn't show up to the office. And he didn't answer his phone. I couldn't get a hold of him and I couldn't get a hold of him for, for a few days. And, and then I, I got in touch with him and he told me that he hadn't slept for weeks. Hmm. Wow. And that he was in really bad shape. And he actually didn't get back to the office after this. He still hadn't been there. And he was a big shareholder. He still is, but he's not been involved with anything. And I realized that that came a lot from the pressure we were on and the pressure I put on me and as well as him. So mm. I could push myself. That made sense. But it's never okay for me to push someone else in that way. And he probably pushed himself as well. I'm not solely responsible, but I'm definitely partly responsible for it. And I can also see it now looking back that I knew that the right thing to do right then was to slow down and stop and help him to get back on his feet. And I didn't do that. I, I kept on running, trying to figure things out and aiming for that big payday, the, the money religion that should make forever and eternal happiness. <laughs> and it would actually take Emil three years to recover from this. And wow. He's still now he's now he's good I would say, uh, but yeah it's been a big big struggle and yeah I wished I would have spent more time helping him and slowing down and I can also see looking back that I barely had that option because I, I I'm not sure if I could have slowed down myself I see this as think that you're standing on the top of a hill. And, and you start running and pretty quickly it goes so fast that you have no control. But as long as you stay on your feet, you're kind of fine. But if you would try to stop them, you wouldn't be able to, you fall. And looking back, I think that what's happened was now that me and Emil were standing on that hill together and we mm -hmm. started running and I saw him losing control. I, I saw him falling but I don't think that I actually had the option of stopping myself because I think that if I would, I would have crashed myself. Mm -hmm. I would have taken on all the pressure from the business that wouldn't work out then. And seeing myself, I would have crashed too. And I'm not sure if I'm just excusing myself for not taking a bigger responsibility for him, but I feel in my gut that it's true that I couldn't have done that even though I wish I would have done that. Mm. And yeah, we've been able to recover our relationship now, but it's been, it's been a long journey. Hmm. And Eric, would there be anything maybe that you would have done differently? And is there something that you've taken going forward with you from that? So the biggest difference is the way I see, okay, so there's a, there are a lot of big differences, but the main thing is me realizing what kind of sacrifices I did and, and he did to get to this point. And if it was worth it, and it definitely wasn't worth it. We could have done the same kind of financial journey, but in 15 years instead of five, and mm -hmm. probably didn't almost kill ourselves doing so. And I think that's, one of the main challenges with, with a startup scene and entrepreneurship is that growth is the holy grail. Everyone wants to grow. If you're doing a podcast, you want the next episode to have more listeners than the previous ones. If you build a business, you want to make more money. If you're jumping, you want to jump higher. It's, that's where we are. And we want to do it as quickly as possible. Mm. It's, much more important to know what are we doing the next month than what are we doing 10 years from now because 10 years is not tangible and i wish i would have had a 
10 year or 15 year perspective on the things I did to say, okay, how can we build something that we love and that we enjoy for 10 years, 15 years? How can we enjoy podcasting in 10 years? What, what is mm. it that we love about this? And once again, going back to that child, then, what would he do? He wouldn't focus on building it as fast as possible. He would love the process. Mm. He would sacrifice himself. He wouldn't drink whiskey to go to bed. I don't think. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Slowing down and the importance then of, of building things over time. Because especially for... Yeah, for, for both of us, we got really burned out during this. He worse than me, but I got for two, three years after quitting Katina, which was in 2016, I've, I've just been recuperating, like getting back to, to myself. For a long time, I, I didn't want to think about it at all. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that story with us. It's, I think there's a lot of lessons for a lot of us in there and um, well done for sort of patching things up. I think that's also important relationships and finding, finding the, that, the common ground again, you know? Um, yeah. So eventually the, the company IPO'd and uh, listed on the stock exchange, as you mentioned uh, around 2016. Um, and that day you made enough money to actually never have to work again in your life at 28 years old. Yes. It was a brief sort of euphoric moment though, right? <laughs> yes yeah so we actually went to the stock exchange funny story on my birthday when i turned 28 <laughs> and me and emil we are born in the same hospital on the same day by parents who knew no way <laughs> so it was 28th birthday as well and it wasn't even us who decided on the day it was some bank, some guy just suggested this day and like, okay. <laughs> so it was obviously the best birthday gift I could have <laughs> wished for taking the company to the stock exchange and getting to ring this golden bell and open the wow. stock exchange. And yeah, I, I made a lot of money uh, that day. But the biggest thing going back is like, it's a feeling of relief. Like I'd been pushing myself in a way that I know wasn't sustainable. The last year, I remember, I couldn't talk about work outside of the office without feeling tears coming up. Hmm. Oh. I have this clear memory of sitting in a group of, uh, of entrepreneurs in a Swedish entrepreneur network where we had this meeting where we we're going to help people with each other's problems. And I had a lot of energy when I was helping the other people, seeing what they needed to go through, came into with answers. And, and then they asked me, it's like, okay, Eric, what are you going through? And I remember that I physically couldn't speak. I, <laughs> I just felt the words getting stuck in my throat and felt tears. Like, I really don't want to talk about my problems because if I open that faucet, it's not going to close. <laughs> And that was all that last year leading up to, to the IPO and, and ringing this bell. So yeah. my main feeling was relief and, and survival. I, I don't think I even thought that much about money at the time. And once that had landed in a bit, then I got to this point of, of euphoric feeling saying that, okay, Eric, you made it. You... You will never have to work another day in your life if you don't want to. You will be safe and secure. You can travel wherever you want to go. And you reach all the goals and all your targets. You reached, yeah, if, using the analogy of money again as a religion, it's like, yeah, you're in heaven. You're hmm. set. You can you're just, enlightened. Yeah. Yeah. If, if the religion is true, if heaven is there, then having all the money is there. Hmm. And, I mean, if, if you reach a goal, something you really strive for, something you'd be really passionate about, how long do you think that feeling lasts? Yeah, it's very temporary, isn't it, generally? Yeah. For me, I think it lasted a week, maybe two, something like that. And then things got back to normal. And I remember I was fighting with my girlfriend and I mean, those problems hadn't gone away. We still struggle in, in many ways. I I got a cold. I got really sick. It's like, okay, that doesn't go away. 
because they have money and yeah. all these small little things that I somehow had imagined would never happen if I just had money they were equally freaking real and the pain from those were the same so I started to feel that okay this whole money religion thing was a lie there's, there's no heaven there's no holy gate <laughs> and that led to a feeling of, of emptiness and yeah I was once again I, I think I felt like like money let me down or like everything that I had expected to happen didn't happen I felt like I was promised I'd made I promised myself that I would be happy if this happened and then I, it didn't last it was all it felt like everything was alive so I went into soul searching land I actually ended up breaking up with my girlfriend because we didn't manage to solve those issues and for the last four years I had just been working so I hadn't really thought about our relationship and then all of those problems that I'd just been distracting myself for they were suddenly insanely real <laughs> and I was so lost without her we had been together for seven years and now I didn't know up from down I didn't know where I wanted to do I didn't know anything <laughs> and yeah we I went on a soul searching journey to uh, to Africa and starting to involving myself in, in a lot of different charities. And yeah, that gave me a lot of perspective on things. And I saw, saw things that I knew was going on on a rational level, but I'd had no emotional connection to, to the poverty and the things that happen in the world. And see, what can I do to do this? And I started to find meaning there. There's so many like powerful lessons in there, I think, for, for anybody that's uh, starting a business or, you know, as an entrepreneur and is seeking, you know, this sort of, you know, this, this end game of like a payout and stuff. And that's, that's just not necessarily what it's all about, but also you need to enjoy that journey more and, um, you know, just take care of yourself and take care of your relationships and stuff too, and make sure that you communicate like you said the one of the biggest things in the world you want to resolve or you think is a big issue is communication and and it sounds like you know you'd stop communicating with those that were close to you and who you really should have been communicating with um and and not just speaking you know like your you said your missus you guys split up and one of the big issues uh was that i think you know you'd probably stopped having sex and stuff um yeah. or uh, so yeah, like how how did you tackle that eventually? You know what? what... Yeah, so going into that challenge, so, so Johanna, my fiance, we're actually back together uh, now after a long time. We, she was working in the company as well, and I, I can I have a very big sex drive, and she's normal i would say so it's mainly me or just somewhere on the extreme end of the scale and obviously both she got quite badly burned out from this as well so no one had a healthy relationship to how much we worked mm. and that obviously took a big hit on our on our sex life and everything around it and i'm a person who is a deep need of that connection and if that doesn't happen, it impacts everything around me. And it permeates and it's, it, it hurts everything. And I can see all the mistakes I did in, in our relationship, going back to communication, that I was passively aggressive about these things. Like I yeah. got grumpy, I got mad, I didn't talk about it. It's not like I... The, the mature thing would probably have been to sit down and say, hey, I'm feeling this and that right now. I feel lonely inside. I feel rejected. I am i don't know what to do. I'm, I'm desperate to solve this. And instead, I probably woke up early in the morning, left bed, went out, slammed the door, and kind of didn't say anything, which isn't an optimal way of, of communicating. And she ended up feeling like I didn't love her or like everything was her fault. And mm. 
not understanding me or yeah, all of these these challenges. And I think this is another aspect of entrepreneurship and, and, and business life that is very rarely talking about. And I personally believe that, so this, this comes from a, a good friend of mine. He's a, a sex relationship expert and has been a mentor of mine for a couple of years. And he told me that a lot of the things that make someone a great entrepreneur makes them really shitty in a sexual relationship. Okay. Relationship. And I was like looking at it, what the fuck do you mean? Obviously I'm badass in bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we started going over these different qualities that are important as, as a lover or as an intimate partner. And one of the things that I touched upon before is that I've been negotiating my entire life and I've been very good at getting what I want. Often so good that the other person might think that they get what they want, but they're actually not. I've just tricked them into whatever I want. Mm. And they don't even realize this themselves, but they might feel it, which is an amazing skill to have as an entrepreneur, have that influential power. It's a horrible skill to have as a boyfriend mm. because she ends up doing things that she might not want to do. I don't even realize what I'm doing, but I'm actually manipulating her into doing whatever I want. And mm. that builds up up resentment and it builds up all of these different feelings and, and struggles within her that the better I am at negotiating the worse she will feel and I'm not mm. even realizing that I'm doing this because that's just who I am and another essential skill as a as an entrepreneur is to fix things and whatever happens whatever problem shows up means let's fix it and that usually means okay the problem is not with me. The problem is outside of me so I can fix it. And in a relationship, that means I'm fixing her, which is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so you're trying to fix her coming up with solutions of what to do these things. And, and once again, just making her feel bad. And she gets in a position where she actually thinks she's the problem when in fact, it's probably me all along. <laughs> but that's, once again, something that made me a good entrepreneur made me a really shitty boyfriend, trying mm. to fix her and trying to do all of these things. And the third one is that it's very good to be goal oriented when you're an entrepreneur. Reach this high targets, reach this goal, measure this, do this. How good is that in sex? It's like mm. sex is about being in the moment, being there, being present, not freaking reaching a target or focus on how to get there. Mm. It's the same thing in a relationship. A relationship is a dance. There is no goal. It's just enjoying the flows, being present, not focusing on how can we get to that point. So I can see how all of these things that uh, that this mentor of mine taught me and showed me like, wow, I've been fucking up a lot. Hmm. Hmm. That's powerful, buddy. Wow, Eric. I, there's, there's actually so much there, Eric. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned a little bit about sort of more or less the ego. And I guess on one level you, you want to always be, but by being able to talk about it means that you have to, on some level, accept that you wrong on or something like that, or, or could do it better. Or, and I think that's probably, if you're a big, strong entrepreneur, you probably have some degree of ego attached to that. And the bigger the ego, the harder it is to kind of, do you know what I mean? To try and accept your vulnerability and, and then come forward with that within the relationship. And then also, I guess, um, knowing what your partner's love language is, you know, there's a book called five love languages and it's quite a good book with this, like get to know how your partner feels special. And you might, you might think like solving, like you said, is a real great skill and you're helping, but if for your partner, that could be like literally the worst, just fl throwing fire on the fuel. So, we actually have to invest in these sides of our relationships. Like sex is a primal part of us. And I think we often, try, we don't think of it as like food or, you know, a, a one of the major things in our lives. We, we try and keep it maybe separate, but we have to keep that intimacy and the connection uh, as, as an important part, which we can springboard 
the rest of our lives from. And, and I think it's, it's so cool that you're talking about this because um, I don't think a lot of people necessarily uh, will link the two. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I and, completely. and so you, you were speaking about, you know, seeking validation. Where, where does that sort of fit in with, with women and, and sex in your life? Yes. So once again, I can, I can see my, my life being uh, a road to self-worth in a sense and, and looking for validation. And when I was a very lonely little boy, as we spoke about before, something that I still managed to do was to get the, uh, get the attention of women. That's something that I've been good at. I've been good at making them laugh. I've been good at finding ways of doing that since kindergarten. Like most of my very early memories relates to sex one way or another not necessarily but kissing or connection with a girl or even a boy for that matter and and seeing how that has become a very big part of once again me seeking validation for my self-worth i i have some deeply ingrained question in myself saying am i really worthy of love and by feeling the connection of someone else and that uh, strong it, it becomes a validating thing that makes me feel very good and equally it feels very very horrible when I'm getting rejected it's my worst fears in many ways comes to that which ties into the things that we mentioned before of not getting that job failing at poker doing these kind of things that I felt a sense of rejection from whatever happened around me and that then goes into to my relationship with, with Johanna that every time I've been initiating sex or, or closeness and she hasn't been in the mood for whatever reason, I felt that like a stab to the heart and it, it damages my soul. Like my soul is looking for, for connection. And for most of my life, I've seen sex as this macho man, primal physical thing and today i see that more as the yeah the physical expression of the soul like the soul is looking for a connection and it can get that through sex and it can get it through very deep and meaningful conversations and and some other things but if if that isn't a part at least my soul starts to feel very very lonely and resentful and mm -hmm. and it ties into so many things and and in our our society there there aren't many ways of finding that that connection especially since most of us are living in in monogamous relationships like it's not okay to find that connection elsewhere either and then that builds resentment and yeah and it all ties into at least for me i believe that it ties into self-worth and starting to challenge that and i crave that validation mm. Mm. and um yeah but I, I think it's one of those things that you can really go deep on in terms of uh, in terms of subjects and um yeah is an important one that's for sure uh, but uh, but actually there's also a lot a lot to, other things to talk about and talking about validation um you had a sort of life-changing introduction uh, through a different Emil, if I'm right. Um, <laughs> so, so not the same guy, but, a, but same, same name. And you went, uh, you were introduced to this IT charity project that was going on in Ghana. And yes. that's now turned into something amazing. Yes. So let's jump into our timeline and jump back in there. So I'm in a, in a place of soul searching right now. And this different email, uh, who used to be a good friend of mine, and I hadn't spoken to him for six, seven years, and we just bumped into each other by accident. And he started sharing all kinds of stories. And I was so touched by his presence and just being a part of it. And I think I had a bit of a man crush on him for a while. And mm -hmm. He introduced me to this project in, in Ghana called IT for Children, which is a school for 
uh, for kids so they can learn IT. Well, IT in the sense of this is the on button, start the computer. This is the cable, plug it in. That's class one. And they needed uh, $15,000 to build a school building. So they had a place to be. And I donated that money. And six months or so later, they were done. And we went down there to, to visit this, this school. And, and this become a very powerful experience for me. So I came to the schoolyard. And on the right side, there were three houses. And they were gray with these steel bars in front of the window, looked worn out and gave this feeling of, of prisons. And then on the left side, there was this splash of colors, like yellow, green, and red colors of the flag of Ghana. And that was the school building that they had built, they had created. And hmm. school time in here was voluntary. So it was after school hours. It wasn't a part of the schedule. And the kids could come and learn, learn computers. And since it was voluntary, I didn't think many kids would come. And the class started at three in the afternoon. And there was a line with a hundred kids hmm. outside wow. the, the school building. I was like, wow. And there were only 70 spots. So we had to reject 30 kids from, from going in there. Hmm. And, I could just look at back of myself, like, what, what would you have gone to a to voluntary class outside of school if you didn't even know that you would get into it when you're ten years old? No ways. Yeah, no ways, jeepers. <laughs> no freaking way. I would never have done yeah. that either. And now they really, they really wanted to learn. And the class started. They had this this class and. Yeah, I only knew that they had learned to start the computers and plug in the cables like six months, a year ago. Now they were Googling, they were writing in Word, putting information in Excel, ripping off Wikipedia, just like I did as a kid. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just to see all of those things was, was this amazing feeling. But it was later that evening and afternoon that, that really created this shift. So all the kids had left. I was sitting in this empty classroom with, with Toshten, who's the, the main guy about behind this. Uh, uh, he's such an amazing guy who created all of this. And he told me that the other teachers in the other school buildings, they can, can borrow this new nice school building whenever they want during regular school hours. And it was on one condition. It was that in here, you never beat the kids. And that was like, well, of course you never beat the kids. So I, I couldn't relate to what he was saying. And then it struck me like, yeah, in the other school buildings, the kids get beaten. There they, they have to be scared. And I mean, just picture how it would feel like to go to school knowing that you would get beaten. Mm -hmm. And that fear. And then seeing the line of a hundred kids wanting to be in this school, see what, what amazing job that he has done and what he's created. And that in here, the kids felt safe. The kids wanted to be, the kids had fun. And in this splash of colors, uh, that became such a big shift for me. I feel like, wow, this is meaning. This is something that can be done with, with money in a large extent. And the world can be a splash of colors where, where kids feel safe and that people feel safe and that there are so many more meaningful things. And looking bad at it, I can see that that's where I could really understand the value of money. The value of money, for me at least, wasn't a big fancy car or expensive clothes or ridiculous champagne. It was to be able to use it as a tool for, for these things. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that was powerful for me. Yeah, massive. Yeah. yeah, it's really powerful, man. And I just love that, that vision of the, the color, the splash of color. Uh, we obviously, being from Africa, we, we have an idea of kind of what that must, must, must be like. And it's really, really cool. And um, tell us about some other experiences, your, you know, your first experiences of Africa. You, you mentioned, 
a sort of a special smell there. What, 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 what did you mean by that? Yeah, so when I came to Ghana to this, this village called Busua, where the school is, and yeah, I stepped out of the, of, the, of the cab. So I picked it up at the airport and just the roads in Africa are not like the roads in Sweden. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a bumpy, horrifying ride and I've probably <laughs> never been that scared in a car than I was there. <laughs> yeah, and I finally opened the door and was like, whew, I survived. And it was, so the houses were built, some of them were in clay, some of them were just steel sheds and some of them were from concrete. And it was um, goats and chickens running around everywhere. And everything was muddy. And I, I felt that smell of the mixture of all of these things and the animals of the dirt and, and of the uh, of the sea that were just around the corner and the fresh wind and the heat and, and there was so many sensations that I didn't have a relationship to before that just felt wow. so new I was nothing like Sweden wow. yeah there's something special about Africa that's for sure um yeah. Craig, because you know, whenever we go home, like you know, uh, we'll be like, ah, there's just there's something else in the air. There's <laughs> this vibe. There's there's this energy. It's uh, yeah, it's really really special. Um, but yeah, but let's. You've now started this amazing initiative and drive and charity. It's called Great dot com. What? Uh, how did that come about? And what is your um, intentions with this business so this it started somewhere here in in Ghana that I could see that okay the world can be a splash of colors and after that I involved myself in a lot of different charity projects and I felt I, I, I didn't find my place in that I didn't find my way of contributing or I mean I, I'm not suited to build a school in Ghana. That's not where my skill set is. And it's not where my passion is either. So I started asking myself, what is my, my passion? And what do I enjoy doing? And what am I good at? And looking back, it's like, yeah, from four years old, it's business one way or another. So that's what I, I should do. And what do I enjoy about that? What, what am, am I doing the best? It's online things. And comparison and these kind of products that I've built before I'm passionate about them I, I enjoy that process and and I can see that that's what I'm really really good at at making money from it and then I asked myself okay so money that's that didn't make you happy that didn't hmm. go this way that didn't turn out the way you wanted to then, then what it's like yeah but if I give it all away if if this project can be be an engine for creating schools or helping in whatever way possible, then it's suddenly another sense of meaning to it. So then that the idea of, of great.com came from, from these things that let's build a company doing the things I know how to do and scale them, but give hundred percent of the money to, to charity and do it with a very long-term vision that no one will ever get burned out. The goal is not to build something as big as possible in three years or five years. The build is to create something that makes a huge difference over the next five decades. Hmm. The, whatever time I have left us is in, in business, and hopefully I'll be 80 or 90 before I get tired of that. And then that's the horizon. So all the decisions, can they be taken of what's the best thing for that 50 year perspective and not the next month perspective? It all ties back into this. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's, I guess it's like learning from, from what happened before and, uh, yeah. changing that for the future. Um, yeah, man. And, and what are your, what are your thoughts like on say like charities in general and, um, like how some of them work now, because I don't know, I feel like sometimes I feel like it's, it's kind of difficult to give money to charities because, um, you don't know where that money is going a lot of the time. 
um, and you also uh, it gets spent on on certain things which are maybe not necessarily going to help with the cause. Uh, so so I don't know. I mean, but I know there's also good reasons for that. So like, what are your thoughts on charity, like in general? Yeah. So what I'm hearing you're saying right now is that one of the main reasons why people don't donate is that pe- money gets spent in like a black hole. You don't know where it's going. Mm-hmm. You don't see. And also that you then don't know what's the result. Where's the positive outcome? Who benefits from this? And I think those two are two of the absolute main challenges that charities have, especially since every time a charity messes up, that becomes a big news in the, all the newspapers. Because if doctors without borders cure a disease, then that's not news. But if mm. they spend the money uh, on prostitutes, then that's news. So mm. it's they're working in a very different headwind because these there are millions of people working in charities. Some are gonna mess up, and that's what becomes the headlines. But I can see my myself. So what I started doing was, at first, I went into this with with my heart. I went for where do I trust people and what causes moves me emotionally. And this school in Ghana became the first one, uh, a kindergarten down in a bunch of kindergartens in the slum in South Africa became another one. And I'm involved with a couple of projects in, in Uganda. And then I had a friend over who had just come back from, from a trip to India and he was here sitting outside on my, uh, in my living room having dinner. And he started telling me these, these stories that he's seen. And he had been there visiting an organization that works against uh, child trafficking. Hmm. The worst horror stories that you can hmm. imagine, but hmm. it gets pretty dark from here where yeah, kids being locked up in rooms, kidnapped or sold by desperately poor relatives, and they can't even stand straight, and they're being burned with cigarettes. Uh, and yeah, worst, worst possible conditions possible. Mm. And he told me these horror stories sitting here, and when he left, I felt like, okay, Eric, you have two choices after this. One is to try to push all the images in your head away Hmm. and not pretend that none of this is true and move on with your life. And the other one would be dedicate all my resources and willpower into fixing this because no one should be going through this hell. No one. And I have the power to do a lot of things about it. And I'm ashamed to say that I went with the first one. So I decided... I I don't want to see this. Let's push this away. Let's get these pictures out of my head. And and I did. I went went on with my life for six months or so. And then I stumbled upon this article in a magazine about this, this organization and the work they were doing. And in the article, they said that to save uh, a girl from this hell cost one thousand dollars. And that number just stuck with me. That, that became my measuring stick to everything that I did. That every time I spent a thousand dollars on whatever it might be, new iPhone, I felt like, fuck, this is a child. Hmm. I couldn't get that picture out of my head. And I ended up reading more about this organization and I met with the, the founders and there's, it's a Swedish organization and it ended up with me donating a hundred thousand dollars to their cause. Wow. And that obviously felt amazing to be part of that. And part of me did that to rid myself from guilt. And part of me did it because I really wanted to, but it also led to me starting to do a lot more research on, on this. And what they did was one of the things that they did is rescuing these, these girls and boys for that matter. And giving them uh, a better life. But what I realized now when I started looking into it is that they, they save them, but they 
don't do anything about the the people that are so desperate that they are willing to sell their children or kidnap other children or so desperate that they're locking these people up or the people who have whatever twisted problem make you want to buy and pay for this. Mm. So what I don't know that happened, but what could have happened is that there are these, these girls here uh, in the middle and we come in and we rescue them uh, one way or another, or this organization does that. But what's very likely to happen, or at least what I don't know is not happen, that they don't just kidnap other people or sell other people, buy other people and put other people in the same hell. Mm -hmm. Maybe even worse, that maybe the first girls were allowed to be outside so they could, and that's when they got saved. Mm, yeah. And now they are held inside all the time so they can't. I don't yeah. know. So what I see with this is, I donate a hundred thousand dollars, but then end results, if we're really zooming out and watching the big picture, might be no positive at all. Might actually have made a negative impact. And this is not what is the common thing of thinking about when not knowing what to do with charity. It's the, often you think that, or I think that money is becoming spent in and squandered away on stupid things. But this is actually a more important part. It's like, okay, what's the bigger picture? What, what helps this? What, what is the cause of this? And after learning more about this, I feel that what can we do to deal with the underlying factors? And personally, I believe that the biggest reason for at least this kind of trafficking and things is extreme poverty. People wouldn't do this if they weren't desperate. Hmm. And Desperation can cause anyone to do anything. And if you don't have food on the table, you don't know how to feed your family, then maybe it makes sense to sell your child. Maybe it's that horrible situation. I don't know. Mm. I wish to, no one to experience that. So what I'm focusing on now is what organizations working against extreme poverty. How can you feed people and solve these things? And one of the causes there is actually malaria. So one of the biggest reasons mm. for poverty is malaria because parents get sick, children die, children can't get to school, all of these things, and millions and millions of people get malaria. And one of the most efficient ways of dealing with malaria is to donate uh, mosquito nets so you can sleep under them. Because most of the times you get bitten by mosquitoes is when you're sleeping, you're not protected, the mosquitoes are most active. And a mosquito net is, a, compared to the price, it's a very efficient way to help. So now I'm donating a lot of money to, to those kind of causes. And there's an amazing organization called Against Malaria Foundation that does this mm. in Africa and elsewhere to see the underlying problems. And I can know for sure that if one village gets mosquito nets against malaria, it's not like another village is going to get more malaria because of it or anything like that so there are these amazing organizations that work with these causes that are so important and yeah that's my perspective on this and what i've yeah. learned on the way that's really fascinating i think there's so many unintended consequences with this kind of stuff it's it can be quite tough but i think it's worth to um to have a check out, I don't know, you, I'm sure you know William McCaskill and his um, effective altruism movement. Yes. Uh, uh, he's like a young guy like you, and I, I could definitely picture you guys doing some work together because it's like, yeah, you're definitely speaking the same language there. And uh, it's, it's, you just got to find the right people that have been vetted by, you know, by people that have done the hard work and figuring exactly what you just mentioned out. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. So, just moving forward a little bit, I mean, we could also spend a lot of time there, but do you have any on, on advice for sort of young entrepreneurs out there or any entrepreneurs out there who are just getting started? So thinking about what we said right now, I would start actually looking in my own background and seeing what, what kind of stories like this have, have the young entrepreneur experienced. What, where, what this, there is skills, what did they enjoy and see how can they go with it, with the joy of doing that. And another aspect of this is to, to just begin and get started with whatever it is that you want to do. It's, 
it's very easy to paint this grand picture and say, I want to take a company to the stock exchange. And then that's a really freaking scary picture because it would change everything in your life and it's so unattainable and so far away that it's just ridiculous. And instead saying, what's the smallest thing that I can do today and get started that I enjoy? Hmm. And I never had the goal of going to the stock exchange. That just happened. I never had the goal of, of making all of this money or doing charity. I just wanted to have fun and I went with it. And I did a lot of things. I tried a lot of things. I failed over and over and over again, and I still do. And I think that the recipe has been just get started and, and do it in small increments instead of big goals. I can see that's, that's been the source of my success is I enjoyed it. I did things more or less all the time and I messed up a lot. I messed up proudly, I'm very proud of all of my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> and, and yeah, let's get started. I think that looking at whatever the goal is, finding what's the smallest thing that I can get done today and doing that rather than creating a big strategy for a long-term future. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's such great advice. And uh, like, I guess the other thing that to, to maybe add on top of that, uh, which I think is important for, for people is that like, like you said, just get started. Um, it's definitely not going to be perfect. That's for sure. But you can only improve it after you start, after you start it, you know, mm. and, and, and that's such an important thing, but people are like massively fearful or just like they want it to be perfect before they actually get going because they're scared of what people will think. They'll go, Oh, this is pretty rubbish you know, and, uh, but that's just the beginning. Like we, we go back and we look at our original podcast videos and like the, <laughs> ed the editing we did on the audio. And it's just like, it's like, wow, okay. We we've come a long way. You know what I mean? <laughs> we're, we're proud of what we did at the time for sure. Like you said, you've got to like, you know, acknowledge that and, and uh, not look on it badly. Um, but you look at yourself now and you're like, okay, cool. We, we, we only managed to get where we have now because we started and, and that's great advice. So, um, and like you said, like having fun is such a huge factor in life. Cause if you're not having fun, what, what is the point really? What is the point? Mm. Um, and so, but look, we, 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 we've, I mean, we've flown through our time with you. There's like 50 things that we haven't spoken about that we wanted to. So, um, at some point in the future, at, at some point in the future, we're going to have to have another podcast. Um, but just before like Craig asked you our last question, maybe you can just tell us, uh, tell our listeners uh, what the best way for them is to get in touch with you. And then if there is, if there's something exciting that you're working on that you haven't mentioned, you can just tell us about that too. Yeah. So, so great.com is my life passion now and, and everything that I'm, I'm focusing on. And the best way to get in touch with me is through great.com. You'll find everything from YouTube channels to podcasts to, to Instagram accounts and listening to our podcast to stay updated with that. It's called Becoming Great. And that's where I'm learning things together with Emil, the guy I mentioned, Emil II, let's call him that, <laughs> of all the things that are relevant for building a business like this and a project like this, but also through a lot of vulnerability and these kind of personal challenges because I'd like I would love to see a business world that invites vulnerability and mm. where people talk about their problems, where they don't do what I did and just shut up and drink my way to sleep. That's just not, mm. I don't want that world. And so this is also something where we're sharing these things through our podcasts and learning these things on the job as we go here and where I, we explore a lot more of the topics that we've been, been touching upon here, both general advice, but also thoughts on charity and various ways of doing that and, and all of these things, things around it. And just, yeah, we the, love. Sorry. Yeah. and just the latest thing now we're learning on, on recruitment because we're now we're looking to hire a, a CEO or someone who can be, be my partner in all of this and be involved in running the, the organizational part because I've done that before and that's not where I have my passion and seeing all those things. So that's, 
that's one of the main things so if someone loves this you who listen if you want to be my sparring partner let me know <laughs> awesome, man. we love uh, we love those thoughts and we love vulnerability in business and i mean you're even putting up your your business meetings and stuff on youtube and stuff so that's just showing how transparent you guys are being with everything and uh, i think that's really really epic and, and inspiring for, for other businesses so our last question here as gareth mentioned is what does being ridiculously human mean to you eric Oh, what a beautiful question. <laughs> I get a very douchebaggy answer in my head saying, that's like, <laughs> but I'm not going to go with that one. <laughs> no, but I, I love the word vulnerability as, as you touched upon. I think that's, that's the, if I should pick one thing that I've learned over the last three years, it's the value of vulnerability. Like, what everything that I tried not to show for the first 28 years of my life just made things worse. And the more vulnerability I show, the more connection I feel with people, the more I feel that I can give to people. And, and it all ties into to vulnerability and transparent honesty. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. And it turns out that pretty much everyone else is feeling similar thing and going through similar things, but no one wants to be the first one telling their story because everyone is busy keeping the facade. Hmm. So to me, to be ridiculously human is being transparent and vulnerable, showing what, what it is that you're feeling and admitting that it's scary to share it. Hmm. Magic concept. Well, and uh, yeah, vulnerability is like a, a superpower, I feel, these days. Like, you know, it, uh, it really opens things up and gives other people permission and stuff to, to speak to. And it, it helps combat that one thing that you talk about, which uh, uh, holds the world back, but also helps it. And that's communication. And as soon as we can open up those communication channels, uh, things do start actually becoming a bit more clear and a bit more easier. Um, so, but I just wanted to say serious, massive thank you for coming on our podcast. Uh, it's been everything I hoped and more. Um, it's been like three cool buddies, uh, you know, two South African guys chatting with the modern, uh, su uh, slick Swedish Viking brother. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it's, it's great, man. You have such a cool energy and, and like a great smile and you, and you tell a really cool story and you tell it well as well. Um, it's, it's very like inspiring and motivating listening to someone like yourself, uh, who's gone through and, and achieved so much, um, in, in their life and, and just sharing and spreading your wisdom. Um, but it's also super encouraging and powerful and probably the most powerful thing is you talking about uh, uh, vulnerability and why it's important to actually talk about your story and to, to tell about the hardships that you went through, you know, like not everything was hunky dory at all. And this is really, really important for people to understand that are venturing on their own, say entrepreneurial journey or just in life in general, you know, let's talk about those tough things and let's not be scared to talk about them. Um, because I can tell you that, you know, 50, whatever, a hundred other entrepreneurs that might, you know, listen to you or watch, watch this and, and, and go, wow, I'm also having that problem with, with my, with my missus or, you know, my boyfriend, whatever. And, you know, that will then allow them to start talking about it and going, okay, it's, it's okay. Um, and I, it's, there's something I must do about it. Um, so, so many things in here, but like, it was just such a powerful chat and I, I really, really appreciate it. So, Thanks for coming on the Ridiculous Human Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun and feels very valuable to be able to share. Yeah, cool, man. Cool, man. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. And just real briefly for my side, Eric, it was a great chat, like I said. And, and what the one thing you're doing so differently is it's just so refreshing is that you're having fun now. You, you, you make it like you're making it fun. You're making it fun for yourself and others. And you're also talking about the stuff, not only that are tough in business, but also those, the, the real personal side. And, and I really agree with you that it's, it is neglected in the, in, in the sort of 
uh, podcasts and blogs and stuff is like, how is this stuff actually affecting when you're sitting on the couch with your wife or your partner, or whatever it is, how's that, how do they mend or where do they meet? You know what I mean? And, uh, and I think that's a really interesting thing to keep exploring. And obviously, um, you know, it's cool that we had some connection with South Africa there as well and, and that you're doing work there and, and just trying to spread your wings. And uh, we really appreciate all the stuff that you're doing. So we can't wait to see where great.com heads out. So thanks again from my side. Thank you very much, Craig. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. It felt like you, it makes so much sense that you've done the research that you've done. It's, it's very easy to, to keep it going from there. Yeah. Cool, right. A good timeline with, with everything. It's, it's a good flow. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. We've gone for two more hours, so I'm happy to do another episode. Okay, yeah, we cool. probably will yeah. need to. We'd love to because so <laughs> each one of those things you discuss, you could have a separate podcast on, which is, uh, which is so cool. Not a lot of people have that um, that ability to bring you know real good uh, sort of concepts like that to the to the fore. So so great, man. Thanks, thanks so much for doing that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do another podcast in a couple of months or something. If, yeah. if this is well received yeah. and you want to do a follow-up. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change.